You may begin, Bree. Awesome. Aloha kako. My name is Brianna Govea. I'm the program specialist at the King Kamehameha V Judiciary History Center. Mahalo nui for joining our live program this evening. I'd like to thank Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald and the Hawaii State Judiciary and Legislature for their continued support of our mission. I wanna start with a quote from attorney Thomas McCann Stewart, the first African-American to practice law in Hawaii. In the year 1900, he said, happy is the man who leaves such footprints on the sands of time that succeeding generations are safe in following them. Today, we gathered to learn about and celebrate the African-American attorneys and judges like Stewart who have had a role in advancing civil rights, equality, and human decency in Hawaii so that the lives of their contemporaries and succeeding generations would be a little more just. Joining us tonight to, sh to share the stories of these great men and women and the issues they fought against is attorney Daphne Barbie Wooten. Daphne is president of the African American Lawyers Association of Hawaii and a member of the Hawaii State Bar, excuse me, Hawaii State Bar Association. She's a formal equal, opportun equal employment opportunity Commission trial journey, attorney, oh my goodness, excuse me, I'm sorry. She's a former Equal Employment Opportunity Commission trial attorney for the Board of Bar Examiners, <laughs> Hawaii State Advisor to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and Commissioner of the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. She's a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the NAACP's Hawaii branch, as well as a recipient of the Civil Rights Attorney of the Year Award from Sisters Empowering Hawaii. Daphne is also a published author and videographer and writes a monthly column for blackpast.org. Before we begin, I encourage our audience to send in questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We'll have time at the end of the program for Daphne to respond to your questions and a friendly reminder that the program is being recorded and we'll be posting it on our YouTube and Facebook page. Mahalo nui Daphne for joining us and for speaking tonight. Um, and I'd like to turn things over to you. Thank you. I appreciate having the opportunity to speak about African American attorneys in Hawaii. Um, I just want to show the picture that I took of my husband, Attorney Andre Wooten, with President Barack Obama, who, of course, is the preeminent African American attorney from Hawaii. Um, President uh, Barack Obama came here to visit in. Um, right before he ran for president. And we had the opportunity to meet him as well as his wonderful wife, Michelle Obama, and talk to them. And so that's what the, the uh, opening of the book that I wrote about African-American attorneys in Hawaii inspired the uh, cover photograph. Um, and also shout out, if I may, to Kamala Harris, who is also an African-American attorney, although she doesn't practice in Hawaii and she's not from Hawaii, still, uh, as you know, uh, she has made history again and history, if I may, um, becoming uh, the first um, African-American female attorney vice president nominee. All right, next slide. Um, I'd like to talk about the first African-American attorney, T. McCant Stewart, who lived in Honolulu. He came in 1898, yep, 1898, a long time ago. T. McCant Stewart was a very well-known attorney in New York. He came from North Carolina. He was also a minister. He was a good friend of Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, and he also wrote for the Freedman newspaper. And in fact, he won a case in New York um, suing a New York hotel who would not let in his friend, um, Thomas Fortune, who was a newspaper editor uh, for the Freedmen. And he won the case on discrimination on a Civil Rights Act of um, 1864. He won the case and an all white jury voted to give um, Thomas Fortune money and damages because he was not allowed to stay in um, a New York hotel. After winning the case, uh, he moved to Honolulu. He came here with his wife and children and he opened a practice here. And if, it was very interesting to do research on T. McCann Stewart because the uh, Pacific, it was called the Pacific Commercial Advertiser in 1898, wrote a column saying, Mr. T. McCann Stewart, who is highly commended, will remain in Hawaii and is here a distinguished African-American 
a thoroughgoing American, if ever there was one, has arrived in Honolulu and will remain to engage in the practice of his profession of the law. So to see that um, in the newspaper, it wasn't an ad, it was just an announcement that he was coming here in 1898, really um, made me feel good as an African-American attorney practicing in Honolulu. And I wanna just say very briefly that it was um, Dr. Catherine Takara and um, Dr. Miles Jackson and Dr. Ian Adams, who all live here in Honolulu, who encouraged me to do this research because it started out as um, a piece for um, Miles Jackson's book called African American Attorneys in Hawaii. And I got so excited and enjoyed my research that I couldn't stop, so it became a book. But they got me motivated to, to write about this. Uh, T. McCann Stewart was a, a very interesting attorney, way ahead of his time. When he came to Honolulu, he fought for the rights of Chinese who were subjected to the Chinese Exclusionary Act um, in the late 1890s. And so he picked up the cause of civil rights, which he left in New York and started representing a lot of Chinese business people and Chinese Americans who were being discriminated against in Honolulu. He um, also became very good friends with Chief Justice Judd at that time. And he was also very well versed in Liberia. Um, there was a movement of African-Americans after slavery to consider moving to um, different parts of Africa. And Liberia was one of the parts that he was most interested in. Uh, Liberia is actually named for African-Americans um, uh, after leaving slavery. And he wrote a famous uh, book about Liberia that was actually um, uh, brought to the World's Fair in Paris. And he brought it there and um, he was considered an expert on Liberia. And um, he stayed only for a short time in Hawaii. Um, he was only here for about six years to practice law um, and he left. And where did he go? He went to Liberia. But before he left, um, Chief Justice Judd, who had welcomed him as an equal, um, passed on and T. McCann Stewart wrote a very um, persuasive um, uh, quote on behalf of Chief Justice Judd. And I'd like to just read a portion of it. He says, when I came to the islands in November, 1898, I brought a letter of introduction to him Chief Justice Judd from a relative, one of my best friends in New York. And when I came to meet the late Chief Justice, there was no bailiff that barred the way, no secretary taking my card for an introduction, but without ceremony and without a let, let or hindrance, he immediately passed into the presence of a man who received me with cordiality and who during the entire interview treated me with such urbanity that Within a moment after I had met him, I forgot I was in the presence of the Chief Justice of the Republic of Hawaii. And so this shows you how he felt he, and he knew he was being treated very well in Hawaii. He went on to talk about um, Chief Justice Judd as a noble man, a splendid gentleman. He went into his room after a lengthy argument in connection with the Chinese cases, the proceedings instituted to exclude Chinese. And immediately upon entering, he said, what do you think of it? The Chinese Exclusionary Act. I was surprised by the question and made no reply. Suddenly bringing his fist down on the table, he said with an expression of indignation, I shall never forget. To exclude them would be rank tyranny. He evidently sympathized with the underdog in the fight. Now, a lot of these quotes that I'm, I'm quoting come directly from the Supreme Court um, books. And um, in the book that I have written, I actually have quotes that you can go and read from T. McCann Stewart. Um, he moved, as I stated, stated to, Niger to uh, Liberia. And once he was in Liberia, he became a Supreme Court justice. So before Thurgood Marshall, an African-American, became a chief justice in America, uh, T. McCann Stewart was a chief justice in Liberia. So he's very much the maverick. Um, and then after a while, he left um, Liberia 
And instead of moving back to Hawaii, he moved to the Virgin Islands, uh, the Caribbean. Um, and unfortunately, he passed on after he caught pneumonia in 1923. But what was significant about him is that he did leave footprints in the sand. And so we were able to start there and follow and continue on uh, throughout the years. And I believe that the, there was a Dr. Broussard who came to the um, Judicial History Museum and actually talked about him maybe two or three years ago and has written a well-known book called The Stewarts about him, his son and his daughters. And his daughter lived in Hawaii, uh, attending Punahou and then becoming a principal on Kauai. Um, next slide. Another maverick is Dr. George M. Johnson, and he came um, uh, to Hawaii after he retired. But before he retired, he has quite a bit of uh, illustrious career. He was one of the first African Americans to graduate from Stanford Law School, and he received his degree in tax. He was one of the first African Americans to work for the Justice Department. Um, he was also on the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights in 1957. Um, and part of what he, um, the U.S. Civil Rights Commission did at that time in 1957 was to study and make proposals, um, study the voting patterns of African Americans uh, and, and make proposals for changes because the vote, of course, was being um, denied to many African-Americans in the United States. And he said one of his proudest accomplishments was when the Voting Rights Act was signed by President Johnson. Um, he talks about how as a US Civil Rights Commissioner, he was an investigator and he had to investigate in Louisiana uh, the way, the manner in which they allowed African-Americans to vote. They would require two signatures from present voters and of course, since there was um, segregation, there's very few whites who would sign for an African-American uh, to have the ability to vote. So they struck that, uh, uh, meaning the US Civil Rights Commission struck that as voter suppression. Um, he, did, he moved uh, to Nigeria at one point and opened up a law school in Nigeria in the 1960s when Nigeria became independent. Um, he also was the dean of Howard Law School, Howard Law School um, in Washington, D.C. for about 10 years. Um, and of course, that's where uh, Kamala Harris is, is, uh, went to school at Howard Law School in Washington, D.C. And uh, so he had a lot of experience uh, with being deans of law schools. And so he moved to Hawaii and uh, met uh, Chief Justice R William Richardson. They got together and at that time there was a movement of which George Johnson was a part of to make sure that Hawaii would have a law school, UH law school. And um, previously anyone who wanted to go to law school and they were from Hawaii would have to go to the mainland law schools. Um, that costs a lot of money if you don't have a scholarship and you're also away from your home. Um, so they decided to have a law school here in Hawaii so people local people can go to law school um, and not spend uh, millions and millions of dollars or thousands of dollars, I guess, in that time, just to get a law degree and to have something invested in where they live, um, people who knew the people of Hawaii and could help them out. Um, so he, he helped William Richardson establish the law school. And the first year class, I believe was in 1970, two or 73, I may be a little off, but um, he became the professor of the pre-admissions program at UH. And the pre-admission program is a program that helps people who may not have the same type of money um, or who may be a little disadvantaged for one way or the other, and to help them get into the law school and be on even keel with other students. And so he was extremely successful in that. And their picture of him oh, smoking his pipe is there at UH Law School, a first year law class. Um, and uh, according to a lot of his students that I interviewed, they said that he would revel them with stories, especially about the Voting Rights Act and his time on the US uh, Civil Rights Commission. And he taught in them, inspired them that we have to use law 
to correct injustices. And so this is Dr. George Johnson. Now, before Dr. George Johnson, there had to been other um, lawyers. And indeed, there was a judge in the territory of Hawaii appointed by uh, Governor Quinn. And that was William Crockett um, II, or the junior. William Crockett's father, William Crockett Sr., <laughs> came from Tuskegee, um, Alabama, and moved to Maui in the early 1900s, um, raised a family, uh, raised a son, who went on to be a prosecutor at, uh, in Maui. And then from there, he went on to become the first African-American territorial judge. And that, and he only stayed for a little while, but still it, it, it's, it's very remarkable that we've had judges in Maui specifically in the 1900s. His son, I believe still practices law and lives on Maui. And we've also had Audrey Fox, who was an attorney, um, African-American female attorney. And we've had um, uh, another woman on our name, oh, okay, bypass, Barbara Ratliff. Barbara Ratliff came in 1970s and um, established a practice here in Hawaii, in Honolulu. And Frank Fossey, Mayor Frank Fossey, appointed her to be the first chair of the Commission of Women, and this being um, the uh, anniversary for the Women's Voting Rights Act. <laughs> I just mentioned that Barbara Ratcliffe, an African-American female attorney, was the first chair of the Commission for Status of Women. So next slide. And then of course, we have Judge Sandra Sims. Um, we, the African-American Lawyers Association of Hawaii, got together um, in, late 18, I mean, in the late 1980s. What happened was a judge, Judge Robert Wan Bei Chang, announced to the media and any, everyone in his courtroom um, when referring to an African American attorney, Jerry I. Wilson, a very prominent attorney in Hawaii, and his client, Aloha Bail Bonds, an African American bail bonds named Art Lee, as two ends in the woodpile, and meaning the N I G G, you know. Okay. He said that on TV and one can't, I can't imagine why he would say that because as he said it and the TV recorded it, the NAACP, the national NAACP was visiting Waikiki. And of course they turn on the news channel and they see this judge referring to a lawyer and a bail bondsman um, as ends. There was a lot of media swarming around this um, and uh, letters were written uh, to the Chief Justice at the time and as well as to Judge uh, Chang. And he did apologize. He, he, when he saw me in the hall, he apologized and said, oh, I meant to say uh, flying ointment, which I think is just is pretty bad as well. But at any rate, we got together as an organization, uh, a few African-American attorneys, and we decided we want to put forth a candidate to become an African-American judge in Hawaii. And so we had our meetings and uh, we um, agreed that Sandra Sims, who formerly was at the Corporation Council, would be a good candidate. And she did also. And we met with the governor, it was Governor Wahe'e at the time. And Reverend Akaka and Senator Akaka were still alive. And they were meeting with the Black community and they also were very uh, interested in having an African-American judge sit on the bench and, and also supported um, this movement. And she got sworn in and she was selected and she became a judge and served well for 10 to 12 years. She first went to the district court and then she went to the circuit court. And this is a picture of Judge Sandra Sims on the very day that she got sworn in with Chief Justice Richardson to your left. Um, and family members to, to the right. And um, so this is that, explains this slide. The African American Lawyers Association um, also decided on having scholarships for students, African American students or students who were interested in civil rights because we wanted to encourage the youth in high school to research and understand um, the need for civil rights um, 
the push for civil rights, the history for civil rights. And so we yearly um, would get together and we put it out to the schools and we'd say we'd want a, uh, an essay, five or 10 pages on the Voting Rights Act, for example, or on um, discrimination title um, seven um, and the constitution and the law. We would do all sorts of different topics and students would indeed write. And if they won, we'd take them to lunch and dinner and we'd give them some money for the scholarship and thank them. And so these are just two pictures of some of our winners. We have Arianne Harper, 2006, with her mother. And uh, that's Rustin Barbie, uh, myself, Andre Wilton, and Bill Harrison, and Sandra Sims. And Bill Harrison was the first um, president of the African American Lawyers Association. Subsequently, we've had other presidents, um, uh, attorney Andre Wooten, attorney Rust Barbie, uh, Sandra Sims, and myself. And you know, we have other members as well. And hopefully they will become president too. We're hoping for that. And then the bottom picture is Amira Fisher, 2019, last year scholarship winner. She wrote an essay on the Voting Rights Act. And um, so we took her to lunch, and that's James Lewis, Karen McKinney, Rustin Barbie, Andre Luton, myself, um, Amira Fisher, uh, Sandra Sims, and her mother. So, and we do want to encourage the young to get involved, um, and we want to reward them for getting involved in civil rights um, because there's more to law than just making money, and that's wonderful to make money, but um, there's more to law than that. And as um, Dr. Johnson says he wants to inspire, he wanted to inspire people to use law to make things just and equal. And so that's the same for us. And um, the reason why we really uh, focused on scholarships for the youth is during the um, 1990s, there was a lot of discrimination in the Department of Education public schools against African Americans. For example, in um, one school, and I believe it's Callahale, there was a coach, a football coach, who referred, told all of his football members um, to go get that NIGG or student who was a quarterback on another team. And so he's telling everybody, huddling up and telling them, go get them, go get them, you know. And um, there was a complaint, and um, Ala took it up, took the complaint up and went to the uh, the US, Title VI, US Department of Education, which is located in Seattle, but covers Hawaii. Uh, because we didn't think people were taking it seriously enough. We heard people joking about it on the TV. Um, there was no apology um, and, and it was pretty bad. And so, and it, again, it was recorded. So we took it up to the US Department of Education um, and the US Department of Education came down with an order to the Department of Education of Hawaii and said, you cannot have these racial slurs. It's against the law, Title VI. And then there were some remedies, um, of course, um, education on race discrimination and racial slurs were part of the remedies. And um, they also had to apologize. And so that's why we wanted to really reach out to the youth, because it's one thing to say this is wrong, but it's another thing to encourage African American students and other students to really understand um, racism and especially towards African Americans. And Kalahe wasn't the other only school because there were other schools uh, who put uh, demeaning pictures of African American students in the yearbook, and that was um, that was also Kalahe. It's not the only school though, and so. Um, we sued under Title VI and got a settlement for the students. But again, it was a very demeaning caption, um, something about we like hog moths, um, uh, things of that sort um, that really had nothing to do with what the students were doing. Um, give us some pig feet and things like that. Um, again, we had to take it to federal court and the, um, we did get a settlement. And I'm proud to say that as a result of the settlement, the students who were in the caption were able to go to college and use the money in a very positive way. Um, the third case of the student and the reason why we do scholarships had to do with uh, a yearbook in Castle High School. 
And in that yearbook, they had a picture of a man, a young guy, uh, sorry, a student, a boy, I'd say teenager, wearing a Ku Klux Klan outfit. And that, of course, the parents of African-Americans complained. Uh, and we did file a complaint with the US Department of Education. Um, and the US Department of Education was taking a little bit way too long. So we filed a suit in federal court. And in this instance, the judge in federal court said, because Hawaii had no history of Ku Klux Klan, therefore it was not um, a, a case that could stand. Now, we totally disagree with the judge's decision, um, but in order to appeal, the clients do have to pay uh, money to appeal. And um, so they just said, forget it. They, they wanted nothing to do with uh, public schools, pulled their children out of the public schools and went to private schools. And um, now, years now, I think people really understand um, the demeaning uh, Ku Klux Klan outfit. And according to the judge and the attorney general who represented the Department of Education, they kept saying, well, this is a Druid. This is not a Ku Klux Klan. But we had the uh, actual yearbook where the student would write, uh, I'm going to get a rope, um, you know, referring to lynching, and then I'm going to get their chicken, um, and which is very racist. And so certainly I don't see how uh, you can't but help but know that this uh, teenager was indeed wearing a Ku Klux Klan outfit. But, um, you know, in a different time, I think we would have won, uh, but we didn't there. So next slide. Um, we uh, received an award, which was we're very thankful for, from um, in 2009, and it was from the Hawaii uh, for Civil Rights, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King organization. And this is us receiving the awards, and we had um, uh, ICA Intermediate Court of Appeals um, Judge uh, James Byrne in attendance, which was very nice. And so here are some of us. Um, holding up our plaques. We received plaques from the city. We received plaques from um, the governor. Uh, and so uh, we, we were there smiling, <laughs> happy to be rewarded. And that's uh, Ramisha Knight, who's a paralegal, uh, Judge Burns, it's not a sense, and Elizabeth Fujiwara, who's also a member, because African American Lawyers Association doesn't just accept all African Americans, but we accept attorneys who are interested in civil rights and support um, African Americans in Hawaii. Okay, next slide. All right. Um, one of the things we did as an organization, besides um, obtaining, uh, getting the governor to appoint an African American judge, is we lobbied for Martin Luther King's birthday to become a Hawaii state holiday. In 1989, there was no state holiday for Martin Luther King, although there was a federal holiday. Um, we would go knock on legislators' doors and, and tell them we want to have a holiday. And we would receive responses such as, well, there's too few Blacks in Hawaii, so we don't need a holiday. And the point was, it's not just a holiday for African Americans, it's a holiday for everybody in civil rights. Um, so we marched around the rotunda at the state capitol. We had Patsy Mink at that time who was with us and marched as much as she could. Um, and it took until 1992, and Hawaii was one of the last states to recognize Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday as a holiday. We had um, Stevie Wonder come and play once it became a holiday, and Stevie Wonder said he would not come to Hawaii until Martin Luther King's birthday became a holiday. So when he came, we had a big celebration at the Blaisdell Center, and he was singing happy birthday to Martin Luther King. And also Coretta Scott King came to Hawaii as well and met with the NAACP and the mayor. Well, the holiday, Martin Luther King holiday now is one of the biggest holidays um, where we have a parade down uh, Waikiki. Um, we have all kinds of people uh, to come and participate in the parade. Um, we have vehicles, um, we have uh, military, we have bands. And the picture to the right is the first poster um, celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday um, in uh, way back in um, uh, the 19, 1992. And it was done by Lily James, an African-American artist. And you can see the lay being placed on the um, billboard and we marched it down Waikiki. 
Um, the building, uh, the picture to up the upper left is of the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. I was also a member of the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission, as was Kay, uh, Faye Kennedy Daly, who is wearing white in her hat. And we always march uh, Martin Luther King Parade holiday uh, to celebrate civil rights in Hawaii. And uh, I can't name everybody in this picture, but you have Bill Hoshijo, who is the um, head of the civil rights. Um, we also have some people from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission present. Um, and so this is taken at Kapiolani Park, which is the end of the march. Next slide. Um, as I stated, the first lady of the United States came to Hawaii with her husband, President uh, Barack Obama. And we had the distinct privilege to meet with her uh, and talk to her. In fact, she was more accessible than President Obama was when we met with him. And in fact, now I believe she'd probably be, um, have more hordes and crowds around her than the president. Um, but she was absolutely fabulous. She brought her two children with her. Um, and she talked about being a lawyer at the time. She was still a lawyer in Chicago. And um, it was a, a delight. And uh, so this is a picture of me having the privilege of shaking her hand. The African American Lawyers Association also is an affiliate with the National Bar Association. The National Bar Association is a, um, a national bar of African American attorneys who come together and they meet in various states. Um, and they have a platform, they have presidents, um, and this is taken in Waikiki when the National Bar Association of Judges came to Hawaii and we took them out on the town and meet and greet. Shana Pete is in the front. She was our former president, our ALA president at the time. And we have Judge Sims, Mark Valencia. Uh, some of the two judges were from Detroit um, and uh, some of the rest of us, Andres Bear, Jamila Jarman, um, and Lone Schillinger. She's now gone to practice in California as Shana Pete has practiced in California now. They've left Hawaii, but they still are spirit in heart with Aala. Um, part of the organization of the National Bar Association, uh, what they do is they do international travel and we meet with other judges and lawyers. One of the travel spots was in Cuba and we went there and we met with um, Cuban judges. We met with Cuban lawyers. And in fact, we went to the United States intersection. It's not called an embassy, it's called an intersection, um, a, a wonderful house right there. And um, we met with Cuban dissidents, uh, Cubans who were upset with the Cuba government. So we did, we did both sides. We met with various people and we had a great time. This is um, our group. And if you notice, that's Judge Marie Milks right in the middle, Karen McKinney, myself and Andre Wooten and Judge Sims was there. Um, so the uh, African-American Lawyer Association of Hawaii represented. We were able to compare islands. Uh, we also traveled to Ghana. We went to the Supreme Court. They, had, they fitted us and had an oral argument that we could watch and observe. Um, they had two oral arguments, um, and, uh, mainly about property. Uh, but the first oral argument, I noticed that the attorneys and the judges wear wigs, British style wigs. And you know we don't understand that. Fortunately, in Hawaii, we don't have to wear those wigs, but they uh, chastised one attorney because his, he didn't bring his wig out and he had to pull it from his briefcase and put it on. And they were upset that he wasn't properly attired. Now, I don't know if that was a show for us or not, but yeah, everybody's like, whoa. So anyways, we listened to that oral argument and then the Ghana Supreme Court took a break and um, at the balcony, there was a choir. They have a Ghana Supreme Court choir. And so that's them on the left. I took a picture of them. They all stood up and they started to sing, clap their hands, uh, one person had a little drum and they were singing a song and I can't tell you what the song was, but it did lift the whole air in the um, Ghana Supreme Court. Um, so it was very, very interesting. And it kind of like took the mood, changed the mood with the music and it was very uplifting. So after the first argument and singing, the choir sat back down 
very distinguished like. And then we had the second argument or argument in the Ghana Supreme Court. And this is a picture of us with the Ghana Supreme Court justice at that time, Georgina Woods. And afterwards we went to another party that they invited the National Bar Association to a meet and greet and we could talk to the judges individually. We went to their chambers. I mean, it's very accommodating. And as when you're African-American, you want to make these connections as did T. McCann Stewart when he became the Liberian Supreme Court Justice, as did Dr. Johnson when he opened up the Nigerian School of Law. So, you know, we always have this heart and um, connection and want to continue that connection and learn a lot from each other. Next slide. This again is uh, another travel. This is to Botswana. Um, we went to Botswana with the National Bar Association and met with the president of Botswana at that time, Festus Magawi, and that's the him in the middle um, right there with all of us. It was a bit chilly then, and we went there and um, meet and greet, and, and we talked about what was, he was concerned with, with, which is AIDS. And so he wanted to um, know what we were doing, uh, legal programs for AIDS, health programs for AIDS, and um, it was very, very interesting. We also went to South Africa and met with Albie Sachs, who is a Supreme Court Justice in South Africa. And he gave us a tour of South Africa. And again, talked about some of the problems in South Africa and the Constitutional Court in South Africa is built on the prison blocks that used to house Nelson Mandela and Gandhi. So as we were walking up the steps to the South African Supreme Court, we were walking on the prison, the steps of the prison, prison walls that came down after apartheid. So it's really deep and heavy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the case law and uh, I'm going to try to be brief. First of all, we already discussed the racial discrimination in Department of Education. So I'm going to go on to Hyatt versus Honolulu Liquor Commission. And I have the sites there for you. Hyatt, uh, is in, uh, as you know, is um, over there in Waikiki, and they had a nightclub, I believe it was called Spats back in the day. And uh, it was a trendy place where people would go and disco and dance and enjoy themselves, but they would not let in African-American men, specifically military men. They would ask for IDs, uh, we want 10 IDs, whereas they would let somebody else who wasn't African-American just walk on in. So there was a lot of uh, discrimination and the, um, there was complaints filed by the NAACP and individual people who couldn't get in. They filed complaints and it, the, the time, Mayor Frank Fossey had placed Dr. John Edwards, an African-American physician in charge of the Honolulu Liquor Commission and they created rules, which they can do so, um, prohibiting discrimination in nightclubs. Um, and this case is a result of them taking the liquor license from Hyatt because of discrimination, the finding of discrimination. And Hyatt sued and it went up to the Supreme Court. Hyatt's reasoning was, well, Honolulu Liquor Commission can't uh, 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 take away our liquor commission for this. Um, and the Hawaii Supreme Court said, yes, they can. And that's history. The next is Smith versus MTL. When the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission first began, this is one of the first cases that was there. Uh, Ms. Smith uh, went on a bus and she uh, experienced discrimination when the bus driver called her the N-word. Um, she objected and the bus driver kept calling her the N-word and told her to get off his bus. Not only that, but he called um, his supervisor and said, I want this N-word off my bus. Um, she brought forth a complaint to the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission and they um, filed a complaint on her behalf and they found that there was discrimination using the racial epitaph, uh, public accommodations, you can't discrimination, discriminate. And she uh, uh, was able, she was compensated for the discrimination. Uh, the next case is University of Hawaii versus Hoshijo. Uh, that case in 2003, the Hawaii Supreme Court ruled that the use of an, at the N-word towards a fan in a basketball game at the University of Hawaii violated the Civil Rights Act in Hawaii. Um, the argument that the University of Hawaii had was it is 
the it was the assistant coaches basketball coach that he had a first amendment right to use the n-word um and that uh you know the civil rights commission was violating his first amendment right well the hawaii supreme court took it and they decided that um, and it's an excellent decision they decided that uh, first amendment does not protect racial slurs especially racial slurs that um historically demeaned african americans um, and they quote a lot of uh, cases and studies, and they said that this is not a First Amendment right, and you cannot discriminate and call people these names uh, during a basketball if you're from the coaching staff. The next case uh, is State versus Batson, and that's a case where um, a African American was excluded from a Hawaii jury, and the Supreme Court said, um, you cannot exclude African Americans from the jury pool, um, not just African Americans, but any juror on the basis of race or sex, uh, national origin. Uh, that's illegal. And in fact, the U.S. Supreme Court has a case, uh, Batson versus Kentucky, which was decided right around the same time. So these are cases that I uh, wanted to present for those who are interested in race discrimination cases, particularly towards African Americans. And you can look them up and read them. And um, it's very important. Um, I wish that discrimination was gone, but it isn't. It's still here. And we still hear cases and people saying it's my First Amendment right to say this uh, about someone not at work, uh, not in accommodations. And uh, you could lose your liquor license if you keep doing this. So um, mahalo for all of you for listening. And I'll take questions now. And thank you. Thank you so, so much, Daphne. I'm blown away by those cases you just shared and what happened in the schools and the yearbooks. I mean, that's just a few decades ago. And right. even in, in your book, you mention how, despite um, all the legislation that's passed, um, African Americans, Black people in America are still struggling for, um, I'll read your quote, uh, struggling to gain access to first class citizenship. Um, and so you say that the real progress towards equality in America is going to have to come from its leaders, particularly its president. And so I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned um, Kamala in the beginning, and I wanted to kind of circle back to that. What does that historic nomination of Kamala Harris mean to you? It's very important. Um, we've never really, ha we've had African-American women run for president, Shirley Chisholm, for example, but not on us, I, I, I guess the word is not serious, but you know she wasn't going to win, um, Shirley Chisholm. With Kamala Harris, um, I think that there's a real opportunity that she will become uh, Mr. Biden announced that she would be his running mate. That was extremely historical or historical, right near the time of the anniversary of the um, 19th Amendment uh, Voting Rights Act for women. Um, so to have little children who are in school to see that the vice president is a woman and a woman of color is very important. The sky's the limit. You know, you don't have to just uh, feel as though you're not part of the um, power structure, um, that you can aspire to be vice president, perhaps even president, and that it's a, a reality. And I think it's wonderful to see. I congratulate her. Thank you. Um, oh, by the way, one, one other thing. Uh, Karen Gibbs, who is a member of the African American Lawyers Association, is a good friend of hers because they went to Howard University together. Just point it out. <laughs> awesome. That's so cool. Um, so we had a question that came in. Um, Frequently you brought up how there was this, in Hawaii there's this like idea that, oh, because there aren't a lot of um, black people in Hawaii, there doesn't need to be representation in, um, in law, in the courts. And so someone has asked, um, why is it important to put African-American history in Hawaii as well as a larger nation? Um, why is this important for the youth in Hawaii? And do you have any suggestions for implementing um, African-American and Black history into DOE curriculum? Oh, that's a really good question. Yes, I think all the schools, public and private, should teach Black history just as they do other history. Hawaiian history in, in Hawaii makes sense, but so does Black history. Um, 
Why? Because this country was built on the backs of African-American slaves. And let's not forget that that's 400 years. This country is great because of what African-Americans have contributed and they have not been um, recognized um, as they should. Um, so yes, I think it's very important. And also living, let's say, let's say Hawaii. I think it's important to let the youth know in the schools, although I have to say I'm very proud of the youth. I went to the Black Lives Matter protests and a lot of the people weren't black. They were from high school and they related to the Black Lives Matter. I was so impressed. But um, prior to the present day where I think there's a lot of empathy and understanding and uh, uh, a lot of people wanting to participate in Black Lives Matter, um, uh, there was a lot of shame in being dark. I mean, I've heard a lot of people who aren't black who went to the schools here who said they're darker skin, so they're not as good as the lighter skin. I mean, and it's not just African-Americans, it's a whole bunch of people. So I think they need to know to take pride in the color, that, uh, take pride in their history. Um, don't just think that uh, uh, the power structure is, is only for a certain color person, uh, certain males, it's not, it's for everybody. And how do you get people to know that? You teach it in the schools, you teach black history in the school, you teach Hawaiian history in the school, you get people proud again and proud and, and to open their hearts and understanding to uh, different experiences. And, um, you know, I, you know, and, and I'm telling you right now, I really, when I met some of these young people that were in the high schools coming out to the Black Lives Matter March, I was just so proud. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple questions uh, with regards to UH um, and discrimination. So one being how is the admissions of African Americans at UH students and is there any are there any suits for discriminations in admissions there? That's a really good question. There used to be. <laughs> um, there were a lot of lawsuits. In fact, Leon Fortson, who was also a member of the African American Lawyers Association, was the head of contract compliance in the federal government. And he kept telling UH, where are your statistics on black students? Where are your statistics mm -hmm. on black professors? Because UH would just call them other. It would be wow. other. And so you wouldn't know whether there were any African-American professors or students there. So he, uh, being in the federal government, he put them uh, to a uh, fire and said, I want to see this, these statistics. And so they did comply. And in fact, they even at one point had meetings for um, black students and black professors and um, black community activists to come in and meet and greet. And uh, so uh, presently, I don't know because um, I, I had a connection at UH and that was Dr. Catherine Takara and she is no longer there. Um, and I do know that there are black faculty at UH. Um, I do know that as far as students, uh, I don't know the statistics. I would like to know that. I think somebody can write to UH and ask what are the statistics of African-Americans at UH um, and find out. I know Quite frankly, the law school has been very good at UH. And I also want to tell you that Dr. Johnson left money, scholarship money, for people who wanted to go to law school at UH. Um, not only that, but they have just recently hired an African-American dean who hasn't started yet. Um, and I'm trying to find her name. I actually wrote it down. <laughs> um, oh. Okay, I can't find her name. Um, she has, she's not here yet, so it won't be. I uh, hope they don't think I'm insulting them, but um, she's supposed to start. And um, you know, I think that's wonderful um, because again, you have a black dean of the law school um, here at UH. Um, it sends a message that, yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. And there has been um, black law um, students graduated some of them have uh, gone on to become attorneys. Leslie Matthews, um, prosecuting attorney on Maui. Jamila Jarman, she's here on, in Honolulu. William Harrison, <laughs> he went to UH Law School. So, um, but I only know the law school and I don't know the other uh, students and I don't know how many African-Americans are on campus. 
Um, I sorry, I'm just, I just looked it up. Is it Camille Nelson? Is that? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Camille knows. She just got hired, and I can't wait to meet her. That is so so amazing. And then relatedly, um, are you aware of any discrimination cases against UH Med School? Yes. Uh, I'm going to turn. My husband sued the med school way back. Um, I think 15 years ago, because um, they wouldn't allow in an African American male um, student into the medical school here, and it's ironic because the medical school was, school was open because Charles Campbell, an African American senator, um, demanded that there be a medical school in Hawaii, just as um, uh, William Richardson and um, Dr. Johnson demanded a law school here, and. I guess they were letting in um, everybody else except African-American men. And this particular person who wanted to go to the medical school was uh, part local and part black. So he had a, a, a connection here to Hawaii um, because of course that's what I was going to say. Too few people, no connections, um, which one hears quite a bit. And um, so they got sued, but they settled. They settled and they allowed in um, African-American males into the med school. And I don't know what's going on right now um, because I, I'm not aware of whether there is any new um, legal action against UH Medical School. I just what want to say, was that a, what year was that again? I'd say in a 19, um, 1998. Wow. Yeah. Oh I just want to say one more thing, if I can, about the uh, argument too few blacks in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry Wilson was one of the um, first African Americans who practiced solo practice in Hawaii in Honolulu. He's no longer here. He just went to the mainland. But he, um, I guess, came to Hawaii and he had an athletic uh, scholarship or whatever. And he came here and he interviewed with many of the law firms. And he told us that everywhere he went, the law firms would tell him, you're a really good guy, you got good grades, you know, you went to Berkeley Law School, but we don't have any black clients. Too few black clients to hire you. So he had to open up his own practice. I mean, that's an argument we hear a lot, too few. And in fact, I got interviewed about um, the police and whether we need to um, uh, make some changes in the police force uh, on the police rules and laws on Black Lives Matter. And the reporter who interviewed me said, well, here's this poll. And the poll had Japanese, Caucasian, and Hawaiians, and others. So I said, and all the polls said, oh, it's OK. We're OK with the police force. And I said, wait a minute, where is the black in this poll? I mean, this is Black Lives Matter. you got to put us in this poll. You can't just say other. And um, he said, well, this is a poll from the Mason-Dixon group. Now, Mason-Dixon is a code for the South, Mason-Dixon line. Civil War is going to South. I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. You know, if you're going to ask these questions, you do want to know who's African American um, and um, what the perspective is, because it differs very much. Uh, African American perspective on police brutality is very different from um, a Caucasian man who wouldn't have been beaten and killed the way George Floyd was. Yeah, yeah. You segued perfectly into this next question. So, um, we're hearing a lot, like multiple suggestions for what communities should do um, in response to police brutality and, and misconduct and, you know, either defunding, abolishing, retraining or completely rethinking uh, the way we do policing. And so I'm curious what your perspective is on that. Um, well, I do think there, there needs to be police reform. No question about it. Hawaii hasn't escaped with zero killings by police. Oh, that's that's not just not true. In fact, I represented a, um, the sister of a man who got killed and he's Filipino, brown skin Filipino, and he got killed because the officer sat on him, put his face down in the mud, he couldn't breathe, he told his sister he couldn't breathe and he died. So it does happen in Hawaii. So yes, we do need, for one thing, no chokehold. Get rid of that chokehold. There doesn't need to be a chokehold. Another thing is training. You did, Why are you gonna pull your gun on someone um, if they're, um, not hurting others or hurting, you know, threatening you. Um, and um, so I think there needs to be a lot of, of policy change. Um, there's things such as um, the commission, police commission oversight is not very good. 
um, how long does it take to investigate a charge of brutality? And then if you do find brutality, which is rare by the way, what happens to that um, investigation? Who disciplines? What about the discipline of the police who, who have crossed over the line? Um, we don't have numbers. We don't have names. I mean, it was, it was hidden. It's hidden. And so there's a lot of changes that need to be made, not just in Hawaii, but of course, nationwide. Um, defunding does not mean no money for police. What it means is we're gonna take some money and put it for social workers. We're gonna take some money and put it for training. Um, there's different avenues. Uh, and so um, take some money and maybe put it in homeless shelters and have people you know, go there instead of arresting them, putting them in C and having COVID rates rise. Um, the thing is that we have options and we should explore those options and not just say, no, that means that you're gonna cut the police because it doesn't. Yeah, and the, I would hope that the uh, chief of police would want to um, look for um, opportunities to um, be more open, um, opportunities to show she cares or the police force should care um, instead of just saying, no, there's no problems here. We don't have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's my opinion. Thank you. Um, we did start a little bit late, so we're going to go over time just a bit because I have more questions I really want to ask you. Um, one participant has asked, in your opinion, what is the biggest legal issue in Hawaii today as related to African Americans? Um, employment. I get a lot of employment law issues, and that's my field, so maybe that's why I say employment. But I think employment. It, I don't see as many African-Americans in the upper echelons of the state, if you will. Um, uh, I know the attorney general has uh, one or two African-American lawyers. Um, and I have to say that uh, the law firms have stepped up and changed from Jerry Wilson days and have hired African-American attorneys. So that's good. Um, but I don't see any African-American judges um, uh, 2020, I don't see any, and I think it's time. Um, and I'm looking for the power structure. How many African Americans heads of banks? Um, I do know that there's going to be a new African American in town who has just bought KITV. Um, and so I'd like to see t a year from now, what changes, if any, have occurred. Um, but if you're looking at top managers, I don't see what I'd like to see. Mm, thank you. That's really interesting about KITV too. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see, was the Aaron Torres case like the George Floyd murder? Did the Honolulu Police Department include his homicide in their police killing statistics for the last 10 years? The Aaron Torres case was not included in their statistics and the police officers who sat in, on him were promoted. So no, oh yeah, but God. it wasn't, uh, the only difference, um, it was not recorded like George Floyd's was to mm -hmm. be shown on TV. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, and watching George Floyd, I felt like you're watching a murder and I you know, didn't wanna see that, but it, it was recorded by a 17 year old who got harassed for recording this. Mm -hmm. um, so with Mr. Torres, his, his sister saw what happened. Um, but again, it wasn't in court record. It wasn't in any of the statistics. Mm -hmm. Why? Why not? Wow. Wow. Um, so you just mentioned how social media right now in particular is being a, a, a tool to reveal a lot of injustice that's happening and sometimes holding police accountable for their actions. Not always, as we're seeing. Um, so I'm curious um, how the media's focus on uh, Black Lives Matter protests, peaceful protests, while there are recordings of rioting and looting, the media is, is focusing on that. Um, in, in your opinion, how is that taking away or undermining what the Black Lives Matter protests are about? Yeah, I think it's a very unfair coverage. Now notice that um, in Portland, they had uh, federales unmarked bands. They would grab people off the street, even if they weren't doing it, if they're just walking. They'd grab them and put them in a van. Uh, but yet, 
the way the media portrayed it was, oh, you know, these are people that President Trump sent in, they're, they're federal agents. I mean, it was really low key, but that was a violation of people's constitutional rights. So getting back to the Black Lives Matter protests, I think a lot of people had misconceptions of what Black Lives Matter means. Um, some people said, well, no, it should be all lives matter. But the point is that Black Lives Matter is for the Black men and Black women who have been killed unnecessarily by police. And so it's, uh, it's people recognizing that there really is a problem because before a lot of people would say, oh, that's nothing wrong, nothing wrong. Um, our police are doing a good job. But that video, um, and not just George Floyd, but Ahmaud Arbery, you know, um, Breonna Taylor, everything that led up to what happened um, is now being seen, especially by the young people in real time as to what's happening. You know, what happened to Breonna Taylor when she was shot in her bed by the police officers in Kentucky? Well, um, that happened in, in Chicago as well to Fred Hampton of the Black Panthers. You hardly hear about that. The police stormed in his apartment and his pregnant wife was there and they shot him on the bed, not just one or twice, but several times like Breonna Taylor. And so, but the outcry was, well, he's a black militant, he's a black panther, he probably shot at the police, da 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 But now people are saying, wait a minute, this is a woman who was just sleeping in her bed, the police were at the wrong house, and they shot at her. Um, and yet there has been no indictment of the officers who did that. So um, things are changing quickly, and I think the, the media, especially social media, where people are actually recording it in real time, really helps really helps and, and it's kind of a raising an awareness of consciousness if we want to be a, a country truly equal then we need to start um treating everybody equally and killing people needlessly wrongfully is has got to stop and there has to be repercussions for what happened exactly exactly thank you um i think we have time for two more questions um we have someone who's written in um, asking about the probability of collaborating on law program curriculum in schools for youth. So does AALA currently have um, an education aspect, education outreach aspect? Um, well, one of our members, um, Jamila Jarman, is, is an active participant in the Popolo Project, and um, they do a lot um, with the schools and are planning to do more, and good for them. Um, sometimes we are asked for speakers and we have spoken in the schools before and I love it. Um, like I said, we do the scholarships and I love the children and, and the youth. Um, we will be very open to anyone who wants our participation. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, and okay, so last question. We have so many current women of color and as mayors and governors, we need to write about them. So that's a good segue to talk about um, the revised edition of your book. <laughs> so do you want to give us any tidbits of what you're including? <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, and don't forget vice president. <laughs> um, yes, we are including a lot that has happened because the first book was published 2010, so this is 2020. So 10 years, a lot has happened. Um, and we uh, haven't included any mayors or governors because in a way we don't have that and I kind of focused on Hawaii, but certainly I think that that's uh, uh, food for a book on African-American or women of color in powerful positions. I think that's an excellent book. And I would be happy to help with anyone who uh, is interested in, I don't know if I'd write it, maybe, maybe not. Um, it takes a lot of time and energy um, but um, I have been reading a lot uh, about uh, women of color and power and the squad and I've been reading their books and um, all kinds of things. So there's a lot out there, but certainly um, women of color in Hawaii would be fabulous. Thank you, Daphne. And I wanna encourage everyone to go out and buy her book or wait for your uh, revised edition to come out. Will it be available on regular Amazon channels and such or? 
Yes, it should be available on Amazon channels and you can always call me or email me. Hopefully it will be done in a couple of months. Uh, I checked with the publisher and they're still not quite ready, but, um, and I'll put it out there. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much, Daphne. Um, I, it's shocking, honestly, what, what has been discussed today. And I really, really hope um, that this is marking a turning point where we're able to incorporate this in Hawaii's education system, because frankly, I was never taught these issues. Um, and the idea, not enough representation, meaning not enough education about the subject just has to go. It's, yeah, it's harmful for, for everyone wanting to move towards a more equal and just society, period. Um, so thank you again. Um, thank, thank you, you for having me. Yeah, and thank you everyone who attended. Um, all your questions were great. Uh, and please have a great night and be safe. Thank you, Daphne. Bye. Aloha.